we go. Good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing this morning? You warm? Everyone warm? Good. Not too warm. Not too warm, like someone's holding a hairdryer to your face. Hey? Love, love, love me a good hairdryer. Does anybody use their hairdryer for anything other than drying hair? Like warm, like warm. You guys are much better than the first service, like warming your bed when it's winter. Oh. Like it was interesting. I preached the word in the first service, and the thing that people fed back to me the most after the first service about was this revelation about the hairdryer. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But use, I had a friend in high school whose mom's, whose mom had, had gotten her husband to build and weld a steel structure that goes alongside the bed and it's adjustable. Where you can, it's like a hairdryer clamp that you can literally run into the underside of your bed so that you can warm up the underside of your blanket. It's a, it's a huge blessing. Um, anyway, so that's the most important thing. If you're going to take something today from the Word, let that add significant value to your life this morning. There are more purposes and uses for hair dryers. Hey, I just wanted to mention this. Uh, Pastor Sean is away currently for two weeks. He's attending a conference in the States, ARC conference. And so we're just trusting that that's going to be a fruitful time. Um, and I'm going to be preaching this morning out of the Psalms. Out of the Psalms. What a great time. So Psalms... Uh, I'm going to read. I'm going to start us off with a bit of an like an orienting text, a, a text that's going to help us like get aligned with the Word of God, like like the, so we have our approach right, um, so we can fix our attention on on the thing that matters most, which is which is the Word. And so uh, I'm going to read f- from Psalm one, verse one to three, um, and this is all about the Word of God. It says this: It says, "How happy or how blessed is the one who does not walk in the advice of." the wicked, or stand in the pathway with sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. It sounds like a good life, doesn't it? But here's the truth. It's, it's, it's the, it's the road to life that comes as a result of delighting in the Word of God and meditating on it. That word, that word meditate literally means to utter or to murmur. It's not just to think about. Sometimes when we think about the word meditate, we think about thinking about something. But meditation is actually murmuring or uttering it. And so what we see from, from Psalm 1 is we see an individual who had made it their practice to know and utter the Word of God. God and as a result, it bore fruit. They bore fruit in season, and as a result, they were, they went along on the path to life. Jesus said it like this in Matthew seven. He said, "Enter through the narrow gate, for the wide gate is broad. For the, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only few find it." So, Mish and I have been been gymming again for the first time in probably six months, like just trying to stay healthy for the past month or so with some of our friends. We've been crossfitting more specifically, okay, which basically is being angry while getting healthy, and you essentially become someone's fitness slave, okay? It's great. I highly recommend it, okay? But it's, it's really, really, really good. But the, the, interesting, the interesting thing about training and training of any kind is that that like in the moment, while it might be excruciating, the training that you're doing, it actually ends up becoming a delight to you. Isn't that true? So while it's excruciating in the moment, you're asking yourself questions like, why am I alive? Why am I doing this to myself? But in the end, it becomes a delight to you because you can actually end up seeing and feeling the results of what it is you're doing. You, it brings life to your body and your mind when you do that. And it's similar to what the psalmist and Jesus are saying here when it comes to the Word of God. That the small gate, few find it. The, 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 the road that leads to life, it's narrow. It's a narrow road that leads to life. But those that find it, they find life. Those that find it, they find life. Life And those that follow this path, they bear fruit and they prosper in what they do. So, can I encourage us as we, as we sit under the word today, let's, let's have 
eyes that can see, ears that can hear, hearts that are ready to receive what it is that God is saying to you today, to us collectively. God speaks to us as a congregation, but he speaks to you and to me. And so let's take a moment and pray together as we open our hearts to what it is that he is saying to us. Well, God, we thank you. We thank you that we have an opportunity to, get to, to gather together, to have fellowship with each other and with you and to worship and to pray and to read um, and hear your word. And so, Lord, we, I just ask that, that you would speak so clearly to us. Holy Spirit, we, we just ask that you would, that you would with, your, with the way that you do, that you would speak to us, Lord, irrespective of where we might find ourselves on this journey of life, irrespective of where we might find ourselves in our proximity to you right now. Lord, I pray that you would speak. Lord, for, for, for those of us that need peace, I pray that you would, you would speak so clearly to that. For those of us who need joy, I pray that you would speak so clearly to that. Lord, for those of us who need breakthrough and provision, Lord, I pray that you would speak so clearly to that. Whatever it is that is troubling us today, Lord, that you would speak so clearly. We open ourselves up to what it is that you have to say. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said, amen. 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 Well, if you've got a Bible, you can turn it to Psalm 3. I'm going to be preaching out of Psalm 3. Today, this is a psalm that has stuck with me for, the, for the, the, whole, the, the whole first quarter of this year. I stumbled upon it in my readings in January and, 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 and dove into it a little bit and wrote a whole bunch of notes about it in my Bible. But, but I just thought today would be a good day to like preach out of this passage of Scripture. It's a psalm of David. And so if you've got a phone or a Bible, like I said, you can get there. It will be up on the screen as well. Psalm of David, and David wrote this. He said, Lord, how my foes increase. There are many who attack me. Many say about me, there is no help for him in God. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. I cry aloud to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep, and I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of thousands of people who have taken their stand against me on every side. Rise up, Lord. Save me, my God. And strike all my enemies on the cheek and break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And may your blessing be on your people. So the title of the sermon this morning is this, Confidence in Troubled Times. Anybody need some confidence in your troubled times? Confidence in troubled times times. Here's the reality of life. Here's a reality of life, that life has its fair share of trouble. I'm not sure if you've realized that up until this point in your life, but life has its fair share of trouble. I guess a goal, I guess our goal in life shouldn't be to avoid trouble at all costs, but rather to learn to navigate through the trouble, because it's inevitable, right? To try and avoid it is is it's not possible, it's unrealistic, because it, it won't happen. Trouble is all around at different seasons in our life. I guess the goal, our goal in life should be to learn to navigate through the trouble in our lives with just a bit of confidence. Confidence is defined as the belief that one can have faith in or rely on someone or something. That's what confidence is. And I believe that confidence is actually a a key to a fruitful life. If you're going to live a life that is fruitful, confidence is key. Maybe it's in making like a leadership decision for, for, for your family, uh, making a difficult decision, a tough decision for your family, or even in your workspace. You need confidence in order to make that decision and confidence to follow through on that decision. Maybe it's solving an issue, like troubleshooting something in any space or area in your life. It's, it's not that everybody can point the finger at the thing that's wrong. You know, that door's broken, someone should fix it, right? Everybody does that, true? But it's the ones that have the confidence to bring a solution and follow through with it that will move forward and progress. Isn't that true? Maybe it's something as simple as making the first move with that significant other. You know what I mean? Maybe you've got your eye on somebody, you know, and you need a bit of confidence, just to, just to if, you, if you're trusting the Lord that that's going to be a fruitful relationship, you're going to, you, you have to initiate something. It's not just going to happen. Okay, so confidence is key to a fruitful 
life. Now, these, these couple of things, they can be described as what's called self-confidence. And self-confidence is actually a very important trait to have. It's, it's important to have self-confidence. Even when it comes to raising children, raising them to be confident human beings is key to their flourishing. So important to, to, to raise them with, with, with a high self-esteem and, and confidence is key to their flourishing. While I was research, uh, researching this week, um, I stumbled upon this when I, when, I, when I was looking at this thing about raising kids. And this is kind of maybe just a parenting plug for the day. But they said, like, model confidence yourself. They said, don't get upset about mistakes. Encourage them to try new things. Allow your kids to fail. Praise perseverance. How many parents know that it's not that simple? Okay. But there is truth to it. <laughs> okay. So we can learn and apply ourselves. But the, but the reality is this, that having high or increasing levels of confidence is important in our lives. But I guess even more importantly, a question that we need to ask ourselves today is this. If I have confidence, what is my confidence anchored in? If I have confidence, what is my confidence anchored in? Another way to say that, ask that question is, what am I depending on? What am I depending on? The truth is this, it's quite easy to trust in our own abilities, isn't it? So easy to trust in our own abilities, to have, to have our confidence anchored in our own ability, to depend on what I can do, to depend on it. And after all, this is something that we hopefully were raised to, 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 to do, or we have learned to cultivate this over time, to have self-confidence, a trust in our own abilities, to be confident in what you can do and what you can contribute, whether it's at work or at school or at home, having confidence to act according to your ability is important. Otherwise, you just won't get anything done. But if our confidence is anchored only in our own abilities, what happens when we're unable to do something about a particular situation? What happens when, when, it is, when it's beyond our ability? You see, so often when we're thriving in life, we begin to have a, a sense of order in our lives. And that's a good thing. Like an ordered life, that's a good thing. We can have a, maybe it, it could be uh, described as having a sense of control, like over our lives. How, how many of you like to have control in your life? Yeah? I see you smiling, Lauren. <laughs> control. Okay? Order. But have you ever been in a situation where the control is clearly not yours to have? You know, maybe it's at work when, you're, when you've done everything within your power to, to, to get that contract or to make that deal. And, 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 and you realize that from now, it's, it's just beyond you. It's beyond your ability. There's nothing more that you can do about making that happen. Maybe it's with your kids. You have done everything within your parental responsibility to ensure that your kids are okay. And now they find themselves in a situation that is just far beyond your ability and control. Anybody ever been there before? Kids get in trouble. Or maybe it's a physical or a mental health issue. You know, up until this point in, in your life, you've, you, you've been able to, to organize things and to make things happen according to your own abilities. And again, not a bad thing, but you've been able to, to, through your own effort and intention, you've been able to, you've managed to get this far. But now you're facing a health crisis and it is so clearly beyond your ability. It is so clearly beyond you. Has anybody ever been there before? What happens when your abilities cannot control the outcome? You have essentially reached the end of yourself. That no matter what I do or how much effort I put in, it's not going to change the situation. Nothing's going to change based on my effort and ability. I guess what I'm saying this morning is this, is that there are going to be times, if you have not yet realized, in our lives, trouble times, where our own ability and resourcefulness are just not going to cut it. 
And we're, it's clear that our own strength wanes in comparison to the giant we're facing. So if I have confidence, what is my confidence anchored in? And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a moment to look at the Psalm of David. We're going to look at why he wrote it, some of the circumstances he was facing at the time of writing, and most importantly, we're going to look at his response to what he was facing. What was David's response to his situation? So firstly, this psalm is categorized as a personal lament, okay? Lament, all right? A lament is a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. That's what a lament is. Let's just say that David had some things going on in his life at the time. Anybody ever had some things going on in your life? So what was taking place? What was David facing at the time of writing? Well, the subheading in this Bible, the CSB that I'm currently reading, says this. It says, it's a psalm of David when he fled from his son, Absalom. When he fled from his son, Absalom. Imagine just for starters, being in a place of betrayal where you need to flee from your own kin, flee from your own child, or flee from your own son. I reckon this would have been the height of tragedy, tragedy for David in his life. Like needing to, needing to flee his home because his son had betrayed him. Interestingly, the name Absalom literally means father of peace. That's actually what the name means. Ab means father and Salom means peace. Father of peace. Isn't it so sad that his life turned out to be the complete opposite of what it should be? Because he ended up bringing strife and the opposite of peace upon his family. The scriptures say that Absalom would do this. He would stand at the gate to the city and address all who walk by. So all the people, he would address all of them. In 2 Samuel it says, he would say, if only I were appointed judge in the land. Which essentially is, my dad's the king, but he's not functioning or doing his job. So if I were king, if, if I were the king, then everyone who has a complaint or case would come to me. And I would see that they received justice. Also, whenever anyone approached him to bow down before him, Absalom would reach out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. I guess the lesson there is don't be wooed by the affection of just anyone, everybody. Manipulation and defeat, deceit is a real thing. So Absalom behaved in this way towards all the Israelites who came to the king. So who were they coming to? They were coming to the king. But Absalom at the city gate, would behave this way to everybody who walked by. And so it says he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. So here we have the son of the king who was devious in his actions, stealing the hearts of the people from his own father. What a tragic story. What a tragic situation. What a tragic reality. To have to face. And so David wrote the psalm after him and his attendants. They fled Jerusalem. They fled the kingdom as Absalom took over the throne through essentially what was a coup. And they, they forced him out. They forced him out. And they crossed the Jordan River and camped at a place called Mahanaim. And, and he wakes up, literally wakes up on the dawn of this new reality. And he pens this psalm. Consider for a moment that it was in the midst of of severe struggle and trouble in his life that he wrote this psalm of worship and praise to God. And so what we're going to do is we're going to break up Psalm 3 into three parts that will show us David's posture as well as his response, and that's key, in this particular, particularly troubled situation that he was in. Are you ready for this? So if you're taking notes, you can write, you can write these down as we go through them. The first part that we see is in verse 1 and 2, and it's this reality of the conflict. Conflict. There was conflict. In verse 1 and 2, it says, Lord, how my foes increase! Exclamation mark. There are many who attack me. Many say about me, there is no help for him in God. Why is he trusting God? 
And as we've seen, David was in the midst of some severe conflict in his life. But here we see his first response to the trouble he was facing. What did David do? He admits his troubles before the Lord. That's his first response. I'm in trouble, and so I admit my troubles before the Lord. And this is a part of what prayer is for us, an admission of the troubles we are facing. Isn't it true? Admitting that we are going through some things <laughs> in our lives, whereby we acknowledge before God that we are going through it right now. Anybody going through it right now? Admission. Why is this important to know? Because so often we don't do it. Isn't that true? Oftentimes we just don't admit our troubles, either because we're scared of looking like we're weak or we think we have to have this perce perception of being strong. People need to think that we're strong all the time. Or maybe we've got a poor theology on prayer where we think that God already knows what's going on in my life, so I don't need to tell him. But no, God teaches us that we need to bring our troubles. We need to admit our troubles before him. Amen, church? I believe this, that it is only through the acknowledgement of our troubles before the Lord that we show who we depend on. It is only through the acknowledging of our troubles before the Lord that we're actually showing who we depend on. I would go so far as to say, to say this, that when we don't bring our troubles before Him, then we're still relying on our own strength. When we don't admit that we're going through it right now, then we are still actually, in, in actual fact, I'm still trying to keep it together in my life. So the question I have for you this morning, church, is when last did you have a good exclamation mark session before the Lord? Come on, when? When last? When last did you tell God the trouble that you are facing in your life? life. For David, it was, Lord, my foes increase. But for you, it might be, Lord, my debts, they just increase. My debts, Lord, my doubts, my fears, they increase. Lord, the interpersonal conflict that I'm facing in my life is just on the increase. Maybe it's as simple as, Lord, the pile of laundry in my house, it increases, Lord. Anybody feeling my pain this morning? Especially with winter coming, everybody. But the key here that we learn from this psalm and we learn from David is this, to bring your troubles, to admit your troubles before the Lord, not to keep them to yourself. But the key, the key is to not end the prayer there. Isn't that true? Because then we just become whiny Christians. Oh. That's the key. To not leave it there. So what happens next in the psalm? What do we see David doing? The key is to move from the conflict and admitting your troubles to the next part that we see in the psalm. And that's confidence. Confidence in him. We can have confidence in him. Amen? So he says this, but you, Lord, and someone needs to hear this this morning. You, Lord, are a shield around me. You're my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cry aloud to the Lord and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep and I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of thousands of people who have taken their stand against me on every side. And we, so we see it's with confidence that David does what? He affirms his trust in the Lord. David affirms his trust in the Lord. What does that mean? That, that means that he is affirming his trust in who God is. He affirms his trust in who God is. Because here's the truth, church. God is not our own idea of who he is. God is not who we make him out to be. God is who he says he is, and he never changes. Actually, God is who he, says he, who, who he says he is, and it's revealed to us through his word. And this is what Pastor Sean, if you didn't catch it last week, this is what Pastor Sean preached on last week about the word. What did he say? He said, we don't read the Bible only for inspiration or information. We read the Bible to discover primarily who God 
is. Who God is. Because you can only affirm your trust in the Lord if you know who He is. And you can only know who He is when you know what the Word says about Him. And so church, can I say this? If you need confidence this morning, stop trying to find it in other places. Stop trying to find it in other places. If you need confidence this morning, then you need to discover who He is. Maybe again. If you need confidence this morning, then you need to read the stories of his faithfulness. If you need affirmation this morning, then you need to read in the word what he says concerning you. Because we gain confidence by discovering who God is through his word. And we affirm our trust in him by reminding ourselves and our circumstances of that reality. Of that truth that never changes. This is who our God is. And so church, asking the question again, if I have confidence, what is my confidence anchored in? Can we say this morning that just like David, our confidence is anchored in the Lord. Amen. Our confidence is anchored in the one who is faithful. Our confidence is anchored in the one who is true, who is trustworthy, who is merciful, who is kind, who is good. He's faithful. He's faithful to you, church. He is faithful to you. He is faithful. He never changes. He remains the same. And he is the one who can give you much, 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 much more than the world or any person can offer you. Amen? So let our confidence be anchored in the Lord. Jeremiah 17 says this, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. Similar to Psalm 1, isn't it? They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought, and it never fails to bear fruit. So in the midst of our troubled times, we can have confidence in God as we affirm our trust in Him. Affirm your trust in the Lord again, church. This leads us to the third part of Psalm 3, which is celebration. Conflict, confidence, celebration. Celebration, he wrote this. He said, Rise up, Lord, and save me, my God. You strike all my enemies on the cheek, and you break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. May your blessing be on your people. What we see David doing here, what what we see David practicing here is that he is anticipating the victory, isn't he? He anticipates the victory. He admits his troubles, right? He affirms his trust, but then he anticipates. He anticipates the victory. This is what faith does for us. Remember, when he penned this psalm, he was at the dawn of this new reality where he was betrayed by his son. He was forced to flee his home. I don't know if you've ever been there before, where you were forced to flee your home because you were betrayed by your child. (laughs) I'd be like, you just get out of my house. You know what I mean? (laughs) That's when he penned this psalm, in the midst of that severe tragedy. But despite the fact that he was in that trouble, he still anticipates the victory. And I think there's something powerful to that reality and to that practice. And we see this too in Psalm 56. Interestingly, also a Psalm of David, which would teach us that this seems to be a theme or a thread in David's life. It says in Psalm 56, 11 to 13, it says, In God I trust and am not afraid. What can man do to me? I am under vows to you, my God, and I will present my thank offerings to you, for you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. The word, therefore, I present my thank offerings in the original Hebrew is the word talda. Talda. That's what the word is. What that means, it means it's an extension of the hand, thanksgiving, a confession, but it also means it's a sacrifice of praise. It's thanksgiving for things not yet received. It's praising the Lord in the waiting, worshiping in the waiting, worshiping in the waiting. This is anticipating the victory before you actually see it. And this is what we see David doing in one of the great troubles he experienced in his life. 
one of the great challenges he faced. He worshipped God in the waiting and anticipated the victory. I think there's something powerful about declaring the victory that God brings even before you see it, isn't there? I feel like it's a, I mean, I can't say this in church and probably shouldn't say this in my day-to-day life. So I'm not going to say it, just in case you're all wondering. But you can fill in the blank. It's, it's almost like a big fill in the blank to the enemy, okay? Call it like I hold up a sign and write on the sign what I want to say. Okay, you can all just use your imagination. Some of you are catching it, some of you aren't. But it's, almost, it's almost like a, like just that when you, entis- when you worship in the waiting, when the enemy thinks he's got you, <laughs> when you worship in the waiting, you're reminding him that it's actually God that's got you. You're essentially saying, you know what? I'm facing what I'm facing, but I'm worshiping in the waiting. I'm anticipating the victory. I know who my God is. I know that I'm facing troubles, but I'm worshiping him despite the fact that I'm going through it right now. Come on, somebody. Have you been going through it right now? Worship in the waiting. I present my tada to you. My thanksgiving for things not yet received. And so, what do we learn from David in Psalm 3? How should we respond in troubled times? We need a number one, admit our troubles before the Lord. Number two, we need to affirm our trust in Him. And number three, we need to anticipate the victory. And this is true. It's when we, when we put these things into practice, when we practice these things, that we will have confidence in troubled times. Not we, sh- we might have confidence or we should have, I'm going to do these things, but I should have confidence. It's we will have confidence as we put these things into practice, church. Amen. Come on, won't you stand with me as we pray together? I'm just going to take a moment before we close to just bring our hearts before God. And allow Him to speak to us. Another way to say that is to allow Him to minister to us in this moment. So why don't you close your eyes. And I find it quite helpful to open up my hands. It's kind of a way of saying I'm vulnerable now. But why don't you take a risk this morning if you're somebody who's maybe been closed off to the things of God. Why don't you take a risk and allow yourself to just be open to Him right now. Just to say, Lord, I am, I've been trying and I'm still not settled. I've been trying in my own strength. And so this morning, with my eyes closed, my hands open, and my heart before you. I'm just saying, would you, would you, would you have your way? Would you, would you take it from me, God? Maybe for you, it's something that you've been. You, it's been like trouble in your life for years because it's. Uh, maybe it's like a, like a, like a, like sin that plagues you, you know, just the thing that you've kind of accepted. It's like in the far co- corner of your mind because you know it's going to kind of repeat. But why don't you take a risk and just bring it out of the, that corner again and bring it before the Lord and ask Him to deal with it rather than trying to deal with it in your own life by stuffing it in a corner. Say, Lord, this is the thing that I know you've been speaking to me about for weeks or months or years. And I'm bringing it to you today again. Might be like the 15th time. (laughs) 
and his patience and his grace is enough. So take a moment and bring that before him. Admit your trouble. Trouble isn't just circumstantial, it's internal and can kind of be caught up in the whole being of who we are, not just certain pockets. Maybe you're facing something in your marriage or in a particular relationship that is a key relationship in your life. And you need to bring that to the Lord this morning. Why don't you bring that to Him? Maybe you're struggling with a health issue. Physical, emotional, mental. Just bring it to Him again. Say, Lord, here's my anxiety. Psalm 56 again says, In God I trust and am not afraid. What can man do to me? I'm under vows to you, God. And I present my thank offerings. I present my tada to you. My thanksgiving for things not yet received. I, I present it to you. For you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling. That I may walk before you in the light of life. So God, this morning we admit our troubles. We admit before you what it is that we're facing. But Lord, we also affirm our trust. We affirm our trust here this morning, Lord. We say that we trust you. We trust you, God. Come on, there's some people in this room who've been trusting the Lord for a very long time. And it's become the ordinary thing in your life, which is not a bad thing, but let it be a little extraordinary this morning. Let it be extraordinary. Affirm your trust. Affirm your trust in Him again. And Lord, it's from that place of, of knowing who you are that we anticipate the victory that is yours. That is yours. We anticipate the glory that is yours. We give you the glory you are due because you are worthy. You are worthy, God. So God, we thank you. We thank you for your, your hand of favor upon us and our lives and the good gifts you give us. And thank you, Lord, for your still small voice that speaks so clearly to us as long as we are willing to pause to listen we glorify your name in the mighty powerful name of Jesus and the congregation said amen, amen. come on let's give him some praise this morning amen. you've been helped this morning church a little bit of a different message, but hey, I want to encourage you maybe just to include Psalm 3 in your, your reading this week. Might be, might be helpful to you. Um, or if you're looking to start reading the Bible, you can, you can start there. Um, but it's a great psalm. And so I pray that it will encourage you. God bless you, everybody. Just to let everybody know, it may well still be raining outside. All of our cafe and facilities and coffee team, everything's happening and everyone's serving. Just to let you know that in the room just back there, we do have extra seating available inside because some of our seating outside is not available due, due to the weather. But you can collect everything you need and move through there. There is some seating in the tent. God bless you, everyone. We'll see you outside.